Hi, uh, thanks for having me back. I was last with you at UKNOF 25 and then uh, 16 before that, so this is my third UKNOF and I uh, appreciate the t opportunity to speak with you. This is an evolutionary presentation that I've been giving for, for almost 10 years now and I update it as the Ethernet speeds change and the technology changes, so take you through some of the latest developments and there's a lot to talk about. A couple of years ago I was talking about 100 gig and 400 gig. Now we have a bunch of different topics to talk about. We'll start out with a little bit of the background and then I'll go into detail on each of the new technologies that we're working on. If you look at the market requirements over the past 40 years, we see new speeds that are driven by different markets. And this is in particular for speed, distance, and cost. So there have been a number of studies in the IEEE and we've come to the conclusion that you need different new speeds for different different applications. One is for wireless access points. Servers seems to be a really good fit for 25 gig ethernet. And then we've been working on 400 gig ethernet for core networks for quite some time. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the ethernet speed development, we have the potential to do six new speeds in the next couple years, which is about the same amount of speeds that we've done in the past 30 years. So there's definitely a lot going on in terms of ethernet and how it's diversifying for different speeds and different applications. If you look at where the target applications are, and these are just the target applications, this is where we imagine the technology will be primarily used. It doesn't mean you can't use it somewhere else. And I'll go into each of these in more detail. Like I said, 2.5 and 5 gig is primarily for high-speed wireless and large installed bases of legacy cabling. 25 gig Ethernet primarily for data center server access and, and server NICs. 40 gig Ethernet and 100 gig Ethernet, we have more speeds related to those two uh, applications. And then 400 gig, as I mentioned, is primarily designed for service fighter cores or large data center cores or even the cloud or something like that. Okay, let's talk in more detail about each of these and some of the drivers. The market driver for two and a half and five gig is, is interesting and it comes from two things. The first is the wireless. If you look at the wireless access point speeds, we have now the capacity to do about seven gigs on the wireless. But all of that is backhauled with a gigabit ethernet connection, so there's a clear bottleneck there. And it turns out the rule of thumb is kind of that you need 75% of the wireless speed on the wired side for backhaul. So if you do the math, then two and a half and five gig makes a lot of sense for these new uh, wireless standards. You also um, need Cat5 and Cat6e, as I mentioned, it's installed already. And you need power over ethernet too. So those are the requirements for that application. And then the other market driver, which I think is maybe even larger, is the large installed cabling base. I started installing Cat5e, I think in the, the late 90s, so about 20, 20 years ago or so. Um, and then if you look at the, the, the volume of installed cabling base, there are a number of different studies. The IEEE did one that I reference here, but they reported that we installed 58 billion meters in 2014, which is about 1.3 million outlets, so about 90% of all the installed outlets. And of that, this is the interesting thing, of that data center is only about 4%. So if you think about uh, office buildings and hospitals and universities and uh, I don't know wherever else they're installing Cat5, there's a lot of Cat5 installed and we want to reuse that for higher speeds. 10G base T exists but you need Cat6A. 25G base T and 40G base T exist but you need Cat8 for that. So there's really nothing that's going to go faster on the existing Cat5 or Cat6 cabling. And there are other applications. I mentioned wireless, but there are higher speed desktops, uh, small cell, backhaul, um, high definition security cameras, all these kind of things that are wired with some sort of Cat5 or Cat6 cabling. In terms of the developments, the IEEE started a task force last, oh, this March, and we're moving along fastly. Uh, expect the standards sometime next year. They haven't decided a timeline yet, but that should be done soon. They're working on two new Ethernet speeds, two and a half and five gig both over 100 meter Cat5 and Cat6 cabling. There is also something called multi g base T, which is going to be auto negotiation for 2.5, 5, 10, 25, and 40 g base T. So you can imagine that that would be used in some sort of multi-speed uh, switch or something like that, or multi-speed NIC, just as we had 10, 100, 1,000 uh, g base G ports, we would pr possibly have 2.5, 5, and, and 10 g base T or something like that. Uh, depends on what the switch manufacturers want to do. It's also going to support automatic MDI, MDIX, so no use for crossover cables. High, high power PoE, I forgot how big the, the four pair standard is. It's over 60 watts, uh, maybe even up to 100. So you can power those, those um, high power devices 
And then the interesting thing, I have a bunch of links in here which I typically don't talk about, but all the, all the information from the IEEE is public so you can go to the task force websites. The interesting thing is that uh, there was just presented in July a call for interest for backplane and short reach twin ax interfaces. I have a link down there in the presentation. And I'm not a storage expert, but one of the main drivers for this interface is uh, something called object storage, where they're taking the electrical interfaces on disk drives and replacing those with two Ethernet interfaces. So apparently the this object storage, which is some sort of fancy new storage, is going to be direct Ethernet attached to the network in these massive server farms, and that's where this backplane or the short reach Ethernet could be used. I typically don't talk about backplane Ethernet because it's not really relevant to you as a network operator, but I mention it in all the presentations because there is a standard for it. Lastly, there are two industry groups that are driving this development. First, we had the MG based T Alliance, which was basically a bunch of people in Broadcom, and then the N based T Alliance forum, which is basically a bunch of people, Cisco and not Broadcom. And they had kind of different standards, and then they all merged in the IEEE, so there's only one, one standard now. But these industry groups are promoting the use of these new technologies and helping with adoption and white papers and things like that. Okay. So moving on to 25 gig Ethernet, this is, this is also an interesting one. The main goal of 25 gig Ethernet is, as I said before, primarily to provide a server connection speed that's faster than 10 gig, but is also optimized for cost and throughput and efficiency. And efficiency is really important, and I have some slides in the next couple slides for, that will show you the math, but it's really important that we optimize the electrical lane speed on switches so that we can get the highest capacity. We're already using 25 gig signaling in a lot of places. We use it for 100 gig, we use it for Cowie signaling, we use it in all the new media modules, and we also use it for 100 gig to 4 by 25 gig breakout, which may be not on the market right now, but it'll be available soon. And then you say, well, what about 40 gig? Wasn't there something in the IEEE where we didn't want to do it, and then we had to do it, and now it's on the market, and is anyone using it? Well, the thing about 40 gig is we started working on the standard in 2007, which was then final in 2010. So by now, it's, it's already you know, coming up on eight years old. And in, in the, that time, technology has changed. So 40 gig is still relevant. There's definitely an application for different speeds, 25 gig and 40 gig. But it is inefficient in the way that it does the 10 gig signaling. And we do have a higher cost and a, a larger optic compared to SFP28. Here's how the math works out. And this is really where the efficiency goes to. If you look at a new 3.2 terabyte switch, there are a bunch of ASICs, or there's, there's an ASIC called Broadcom Tomahawk that a bunch of vendors are going to be using, probably shipping sometime this fall. So when I mentioned a 3.2 terabit chip, that's kind of the new benchmark for off-the-shelf components. So we look at this chip and we say, how much utilization can we get out of it? And if you see the top chart, if we use 10 gig lanes, we can get uh, about half the capacity versus if we use 25 gig lanes. And then if you expand that to a big data center that has maybe 100,000 servers, it's, it's quite a bit few less top of rack switches. So there's two efficiencies. There's one in the switch and then one in the network that you get. You can look at it another way if you just break it out by port speed, 10, 25, 40, and 100. We get a lot more efficiency if we use 25 gig signaling for either 25 gig Ethernet or 100 gig Ethernet versus using 10 gig signaling for 10 or 40 gig Ethernet. So that's the, what the efficiency is all talking about. In terms of developments, there's two things going on. There was a 25 g based t study group that formed. They just decided to merge with the 40 g based t task force. There's one standard, um, you know, no change in schedule. They just kind of slipped it in. This is going to be 30 meter CAT 8. And then there's a lot going on in fiber optic cables and copper cables. And I realize this is a wall of text slide, but I wanted to fit everything uh, on one slide, so I'll just point out some of the highlights. Uh, there are a bunch of different copper options, and the difference is in the FEC. FEC is forward error correction. There's two things that, that FEC does. One is it, it gives you a better bit error rate, but the other thing that it does too is it increases latency. So there's three different options, no FEC, the base R FEC, and then the RS or Reed Solomon FEC, which all provide different bit error rates and different latencies for different applications. So the goal here is to have choices in short reach interconnect based on what your application is trying to do. Microsoft has been very vocal in the IEEE about having a short reach NoFEC standard, so that's their goal. And then others have 
also advocated for a very complicated effect, which gives you, like I said, a much better bit error rate, but also adds latency. So there's a bunch of copper standards that have been defined. There's a bunch of passive direct ca attached cables which have been defined. And fortunately, we have auto negotiation between these interface types and the FEC. So a lot of choices for different things that you're trying to do. This standard is also moving along pretty quickly like the 2.5 and 5G standards. So we expect it probably sometime uh, by this time next year, actually. There's also the 25 gigabit Ethernet cons consortium. This was founded in July by a bunch of people that had a failed call for interest in the IEEE. They basically said, okay, we're gonna do our own thing. And then we had another call for interest in the IEEE, which was successful. They're developing 25 and 50 gig standards outside of the IEEE. Uh, it has optional FEC, optional on negotiation, and the web page is very specifically written, and this is a quote here, specifications only for backplane and twin-axe copper cable, but does not address or preclude active, op or, uh, active optical cable or fiber interfaces. So who knows what they're doing. The draft specification is only available to members, so I can't access it and I, I can't tell you what's in it. But my guess is that they're probably going to try and develop a longer reach 25 gig interface because in the IEEE we only have a, a multi-mode 100 meter interface right now. Here's a technology reference slide. I have one of these for each technology. I typically don't read them because it's a lot like Logan poetry, which you know, is not pleasant to hear. So I just skip over these, but know that everything that you ever wanted to know about an Ethernet standard is here from the name to the standard, the electrical signaling, media type, and all that kind of stuff. So I'll just skip through these in the future slides. Okay, on to 40 gig. How are we doing on time? Good? Okay. Uh, 40 gigs is pretty much done. We have all these, these QSFP modules. We have a bunch of different types of cabling options that are available to you. We have some for data center and server access, which are typically the breakout cables, so 40 gig into 4 times 10 gig. We also have native 40 gig for aggregation and core. The one thing that we added is this February, we had the ER4 standards, so 40 kilometer over single mode fiber, and as I mentioned, the 40G based T task force is also working on the twisted pair option. It's 30 meters over CAT8, and the standard is moving along quickly and expected in March next year. So that pretty much wraps up 40 gig. There's not a whole lot more uh, development that I, would, that I would expect we'd have around 40 gig, so it's pretty much done. Here's your technology reference. And then moving on to 100 gig. So I showed this slide at UKNOF 25, and I was optimistic, but I was wrong about the market adoption. I was more exuberant back then um, about adoption, but it turned out to be uh, a couple years late. So now there's, there's uh, a bunch of people that are predicting that 2016 is indeed the year of 100 gig, and it's driven primarily by two things. One is that 3.2 terabit chip that I mentioned, and the other is smaller form factors, which are the uh, QSFP28 and the CFP4 modules. So that's what we really need to take 100 gig from, from early adopters to cross that chasm into early majority and, and what I call mainstream adoption. So this is interesting. Uh, it's based on a diffusion theory, uh, which is was also explained in a book called Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. It's about technology adoption. And the point is basically two things, that any technology adoption follows a bell curve. And what I remember from my statistics class is that everything is a bell curve. But it's very interesting because this applies to any technology. It could be iPhones or shoes or um, jackets or something, but there's always an early adopters group and an innovators group, and then it moves into the mass market and crosses this chasm, which is kind of the jump that you need to go from, um, from a small market into a mass market. And then sometime in the next couple of years, when we have 100 gig serial and, and theoretical 100 gig SFPs, then we'll see you know, much higher density and, and more adoption. This is also an older slide. You may have seen it before. I'll just uh, summarize it. But the fundamental problem that we have with the first generation 100 gig E's, we have a lot of 10 gig signaling. So we have 10 gig electrical, sometimes 10 gig on the optical, and we want to just go to 25 gig signaling because that's the next best technology that we have right now for signaling. All the second generation modules are based on this 25 gig signaling. In terms of developments, there's not a lot going on with 100 gig. Uh, there is a, a new standard that was approved on last February. It also includes the, the 40 uh, kilometer um, ER4 for 40 gig. But 
what's more interesting is the things that didn't go through uh, than what actually went through. The interesting things that went through is a new short reach interface. So we have 100 G base SR4 now instead of SR10. So it uses four lanes instead of 10 lanes. The other interesting things is that we defined a bunch of signaling for the new optic types. So that was important. What didn't make it through, I'll tell you in the next couple of slides uh, after the modules. This is just a quick a quick view of the 100 gig module evolution. We see the same thing like we did from, from 10 gig, if you remember, 10 gig when it came out in 2002. It was a giant 300 pin MSA fixed optic type and now we have you know, XFP for, for 10 gig. We'll see the same thing for 100 gig. We started out with CFP in 2010. Now, like I said before, 2015, the main new optic types are the QSFP28 and the CFP4. If I had to kind of explain those in layman's technology, I would say that the QSFP, because of the power limitation, it supports up to 3.5 watts of power, is primarily a short reach optic, and the, the CFP4 can support up to 9 watts, so it would primarily be a longer reach optic. But again, you know, th those, aren't, those aren't hard and fast distances. Um, it's, un it's unlikely or unknown that we'll see ER4 in a QSFP28. I don't know if, if the optics vendors can fit it in there. We'll definitely see it in CFP4, and the other thing is that the, uh, the, the management interface on the QSFP and the CFP4 are different. The CFP4 has a much more complex management interface, so that means that we can do things like coherent optics in the CFP4 that we probably can't do in, in the QSFP28. Here's a couple new slides, or new pictures that I put into this slide. Um, upgraded pictures, I used to have iPhone 4 pictures, now I have iPhone 6 pictures, just kind of tells you the relations of the different optical module sizes, so you can see that CFP4 is it's quite big, it's about the size of an iPhone 6, or actually just a tiny bit larger, and then as you get into the next generation, CFP2 is about half that size, CFP4 is about half that size, and you can see from the pictures of the stacked modules that with CFP4, we're getting to the faceplate size of XFP, but it's slightly longer than XFP, so it's getting down to that XFP size, uh, which is a good form factor. This is this is a problem. This space is a little bit crowded, and this is a result of things not getting done in the IEEE. So you remember we had a VHS versus Betamax debate sometime when we still had, uh, you know, videotapes. Uh, this is kind of like four Betamaxes instead of one. So because we couldn't agree in the IEEE, a bunch of different groups that were pushing those standards in the IEEE went and said, okay, we'll just do this ourselves. So we have now four different MSAs. Uh, the, the one, the 10 by 10 MSA, was popular when 100 gig first came out because they offered a cheaper and a, a different distance than the IEEE standard. This MSA, I think, is, is kind of done now. In fact, the website doesn't even work anymore. It goes to a, a blank page. So I don't expect much development with the 10 by 10 MSA, but certainly these other four groups are pushing a short range, single mode interface that is for large scale data centers, so 500 meter to two kilometer because there's nothing for 100 gig in the IEEE that meets that objective. So I don't know how this is gonna play out, but it's obvious that the market can't support four different, four different new optics and four different standards, and they're all driven by, by different people. So Microsoft is, is a big proponent of PSM4. It's over parallel single mode fiber. I, don't, I personally don't like parallel fiber, but, but it worked for them. And then you have different people that are push, pushing the different groups. And then the one on the end is interesting because it's, it's basically Mellanox and, and Sienna that are, that are uh, trying to do this standard. So I don't know that there's a whole lot of industry support there. The two in the middle have more industry support with different component vendors and system vendors and some network operators. But it's all still to be seen uh, what, what happens with that short reach interface. So here's your technology reference. Then moving on to 400 gig, and this one is interesting, and people say, okay, well, why didn't we do terabit? I'd love to do terabit. Terabit sounds cool, uh, it sounds fast, it sounds really awesome. The point is that we know that we need terabit links, we know that we can't do it from a technical and economic perspective. It just, it's impractical today. So the next best choice was either to not do anything for several years, say, uh, you know, maybe wait until 2020 to start a terabit ethernet project, or we could do something now for 400 gig that kind of gets us there uh, you know, with, with something in between. So we have to take all these things into consideration, and this is done in the IEEE. We weigh all these different things between the technical feasibility in terms of the form factor, optical signaling, electrical signaling, and then the different market requirements from different 
vendor or different network operators, and it's different. You know, cloud and data center providers have a very different requirement than an internet exchange or a transit or transport provider or something like that. So in terms of 400 gig, the task force started a couple of years ago. There are a number of objectives and, and reaches that have been defined. Um, 100 meter uh, parallel multi-mode fiber, 500 meter parallel single mode fiber, a two kilometer and a 10 kilometer. There's also a strong desire to support a 400 to four times 100 gig breakout like we had for 40 to four times 10s, so that's very popular. There's been a lot of discussion in the task force, and I'll show you why in the next slide, which has led us to a delayed standard. So we hope for something in about March of 2017, but the IEEE is about eight months behind the schedule and they're meeting this week, so uh, we'll know after this week when the new expected delivery date is. But the reason that there is so much discussion is that there were a lot of options to consider. And this is where it gets hard. So for gig and 10 gig, we're basically just blinking a light really fast. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but that's just what we're doing. It's a blinking light. For 100 gig and 400 gig, this gets into really complex um, you know, optical modulation and digital, digital signal processing and all that kind of stuff that is very complicated technology and also is some, sometimes proprietary technology from an optics or uh, an optical vendor. So it gets hard and there are a lot of, a lot of uh, different things to consider. There were a lot of options that were presented in the IEEE and this led to a lot of discussion which delayed the standard. We eventually came to consensus in the IEEE to use uh, a number of different encodings but they're all based around PAM4. And this is also a departure than traditional ethernet encoding. Most ethernet standards until now use NRZ as we went faster and over longer distances, we figured out PAM4 is probably going to be a better choice and that's why we ended up with PAM4 encoding for the longer reach interfaces. There's basically four, four ways to go faster. You can change your signaling speed, you can change modulation, number of lambdas or number of fibers and some sort of combination of those. So the goal in the IEEE was to take all these available options, put them together and then figure out which one worked best from a technical and from an economic feasibility. So that's why it took so long and that's why the standard was delayed. In terms of uh, pluggable modules, there's two modules that will be on the market soon. One is the CDFP, it's a short range uh, optical module and then the other is a CFP2. So the CFP2 has an enhanced connector that you can use for 50 gig signaling. So the same CFP2 that we use for 100 gig today we'll be able to use for 400 gig in the future and then sometime in, in 2020 maybe there will be a, a 100 gig serial module and then that's really when ethernet at, at terabit speeds becomes feasible but really not before then. Okay, so to, uh, to sum it all up, I know that was a lot and I talked fast but here's the, the key takeaways. Ethernet's evolving for different market requirements. We have different new speeds for different applications and really what we've realized is that the 10x, 3x, so 10 times the performance for 3x the cost doesn't work anymore. We had 100 meg, or 10 meg, 100 meg, gig, 10 gig, 100 gig, and it, it didn't really work for 100 gig because 100 gig was not 3x the cost of 10 gig. Certainly when it came out, it was probably 14 to 12. Now we're, we may see, I don't know, 6x the cost of, of 10 gig for 100 gig. It's getting down there, especially with the QSFP28 and the CFP4, but so we're finally getting down to that 10x, 3x. So it turns out the best technical and economic solution is 4x to 8x. So we have 4 times 10 gig for 40 gig, 4 times 25 for 100 gig, 8 times 50 for 40 gig. And then as we went from 10 gig electrical signaling to 25 gig signaling, we're looking at 50 gig signaling in the future. And this could be the basis of new ethernet speeds, namely uh, 50 gig and 200 gig ethernet. There is an effort in the IEEE to introduce a call for interest which would start the official study group in the IEEE and that could happen as early as November or sometime in the spring of next year. So it's likely that if this passes we'd see 200 gig yeah, in the next couple of years. So in terms of the speed evolution summary, we have two and a half and five gig for higher speed wireless and CAT5 and CAT6E application. 10 gig is pretty much widely deployed everywhere. I don't think we'll see any more development there. 25 gig ethernet is coming for servers and top of rack applications. 40 gig ethernet is really popular and it's, it's pretty much done now and we're in the second generation technology with 100 gig with the CFP2, CFP4 and QSFP28 optics. 40, 400 gig development is underway and ethernet at terabit speeds, it's still, unfe it's still unfeasible right now. 
We'll get there eventually, and you'll notice that I wrote Ethernet at terabit speeds and not terabit Ethernet, so it's unlikely that the next speed after this will be one terabit. It's likely to follow that 4x signaling model, so it, it could be 1.6 terabit uh, or something like that. So we kind of have to get away from that, that 10x speed increase thinking. Uh, here's a bunch of information, references to all the IEEE websites and all the optics websites. Here's the acknowledgments, and I have tons and tons of reference slides uh, that are next that we're not going to go through. This whole deck is 51 slides, and uh, this is the last slide that we'll present. <sighs> <Okay. So laughs> all right, questions. <laughs> I think you're supposed to come to the microphone, please. Hi, I'm Nick Hart from Lancaster University. Um, variable rate Ethernet, 200 meg, 2 gig. Yes. Google have talked about it. Reflections? Yes. So, in the, uh, so this actually came up when we were first looking at, well, it was called the Higher Speed Study Group back in 2006 before we decided to do 100 gig and 40 gig. We were talking about, can we do some sort of variable speed Ethernet? And it's been looked at before uh, as well. And the, the general consensus was, it's really hard and it's more trouble than it's worth. And it would just add a lot of complexity, which adds costs. So in the IEEE, there is no talk about doing a variable speed Ethernet beyond the different auto negotiation types that you could have on a, on a PHY or a, a Mac. So you, you could have auto negotiation on the port, but there's no talk about some sort of variable speed Ethernet. Uh, it also gets complicated because a lot of the higher speed Ethernets are a combination of different lanes. So then, okay, you have to talk about, okay, so we have four times 25 gig, which is a 100 gig Ethernet interface. What happens if you lose one of the lanes? Do you go back to 75 gig or you know, do you take the whole interface down? So it gets into a lot of complicated discussion and it was just decided that it's, it's too costly to do it. Good question, though. Okay, any other questions for Greg? Wait, we have one from Martin at the back. I think I know what you're going to ask. Yeah, you, th you think you know what I'm gonna ask. Um, why is it still called Ethernet? <laughs> And, 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 and when you thought about that one, you can answer the question I'm gonna, you know I'm going to ask. Yeah. I don't know. So why is it still called Ethernet? It's a good question. Um, I'm trying to think here because the IEEE uh, actually, I believe, owns the trademark or the name Ethernet. So it's, theirs, you know, it's their name, and they're the only one that can make official Ethernet standards. Um, I think it's called Ethernet because primarily because it's an evolution of the same frame format, which is the original Ethernet format. Um, so that's the way I would answer that question. And Martin's second question is, what about jumbo frames? <laughs> and uh, I don't have a good, a good answer to that question either. It's been asked a number of times by various people, and I've even been yelled at uh, by Randy Bush, I think, about it. Um, but I don't have a good answer, and that's unfortunate. So, there's a desire to have a standardized jumbo frame. And in the IEEE, I can tell you there's no interest in doing that. There's every IEEE specification starts out with preserve the minimum and maximum frame size. And it's, you know, that's in every new technology specification that the IEEE has developed for Ethernet. So I think there's a lot of concern about adding uh, interoperability between all the legacy interfaces. So that's, you know, that's a big concern. Uh, but really, I didn't have a good answer to this question, and what I tell people is we're not seeing any interest in the IEEE, which is because there's no interest from the vendors, which is because there's no interest from the customers. So if you go to your system vendor and say, I want to standardize Gemma frame, then that will motivate them to start something in the IEEE, which would potentially uh, be a new standard. But that's the, only, that's the only answer I've come up with over these years, and I don't think it's a good one, and I apologize for that, but I don't have a better answer other than if it's important to you, talk to your system vendors. Okay, well we can have a competition in the bar later on led by Martin as to what we should call it instead. All right, thanks. Uh, thanks, Greg. <laughs>